Good afternoon, Michael Malice here. Let that be your welcome for the next hour. We have with us a guest who is long overdue and an episode I'm quite excited about. Uh, my buddy Seth Dillon, who is the CEO of the Babylon Bee, who is a website which is doing more to probably subvert the political process in America than all the libs of TikTok people combined, um, because you guys use humor so effectively. And John Stewart, I think, in many ways, pioneered this from the left, where people who are apolitical, they want to be on the side of the guys who are laughing. And for a long time, people on the right were the humorless ones, although there's kind of revisionism. We were always the funny ones. And you guys really have come out swinging and are just doing amazing work. Uh, so there's two things I want to open with and, and, and talk about. One of the two great privileges of my life, one was um, there was a Babylon Bee article written about me uh, for my birthday. <laughs> it came out a few months late, but who cares? So that was what, like, check, bucket list. And also, uh, when I was working with UFC fighter Matt Hughes on his autobiography, I helped him write his testimony, which was something I was very proud to be in a position to do. And I want to talk to you about that, how you found your faith. But right. before we get into that, I do want to discuss um, the rise of the Babylon Bee. And here's a, a, a parallel you might not like entirely. Uh, when Roger Ailes was first starting Fox News, uh, you know, the people he was working with were like, you know, you're going to be a competitor with CNN. He goes, no, 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 I want to beat CNN. And he basically drove them into the ground, revolutionized cable news. And now people who are older, who are in the left, like wish for a day where Fox News was the only voice that they had to worry about. You guys start out in some ways. I remember when you're up and coming as, oh, they're the right wing onion. Mm -hmm. And now the onion, I think, has completely fallen by the wayside and the bee is its own entity so can you walk us through that path about how you your site became so successful yeah well thanks for the kind words to begin with i appreciate that um uh and it is long overdue it's great to be here with you finally um uh, you know uh, glad that we've established a little bit of a relationship and and finally worked this out um the bee so the bee started in 2016, so it's not that old. We just turned eight in March, so we haven't been around for forever. Um, and it was it was definitely characterized initially as you know a conservative version of the Onion, which um, which I think was a fair characterization because it was it was designed to be that way. Really, it was designed to fill that void where you know nobody was doing satirical news from from a, a different worldview perspective, a different ideology, political ideology, religious, you know, or theological, uh, perspective. Um, it wasn't really being done at all. And, and the onion and other, uh, secular and left leaning comedians were all over the place and very prominent. Um, and you had a lot of very successful late night shows and, um, and of course, you know, really the onion was, it was the name in news satire and it's satire has been around for a long time. It's an age old thing. It, people people act like the onion started it and that we're imitating the onion but the onion is imitating something that has been a, a, a form of 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 critical commentary on on culture and politics for centuries so um the onion wasn't the originator but we were kind of an answer to the onion in the sense that you know there's this you know this uh, popular news satire publication coming at things from a left perspective and we were going to offer a different perspective. So I think it was an apt characterization, at least initially. And then as the bee has grown and, you know, we started out with all these church jokes, you know, one of the first headlines I came across was about how the Holy Spirit was unable to move through the congregation as the fog machine had broken. And, and it was like this cloudy auditorium where you could barely see the, the stage. And, and uh, I, I saw jokes like that. And I was, you know, I grew up in the church myself uh, as, a, as a pastor's kid. And and so there were these inside jokes that were really appealing, but then there was the broader kind of cultural and political commentary that was getting a lot of traction going viral all over the place. So um, the bees come into its own at this point. I, we've actually surpassed the onion in traffic and engagement. We did that a couple of years ago. So um, it's pretty cool to be like the name in satire now that, that you know, and, and we're, we're still kind of dominate dominant in this space. There isn't really anybody who's kind of come up behind us and is looking to pass us, at least not at the moment. So um, we'd like to maintain that as long as we can. Yeah. The, the thing about The Onion, which is just very disappointing to me, I, I was a huge fan. And we have a president in the White House who is, you know, effectively deceased. 
<laughs> and I remember, I think the first Onion headline I read, and this must have been way over 10 years ago, was drinking dog urine found to extend lifespan, snickering researchers say. And it's all about this press conference where all these scientists are just like laughing at themselves, being, yeah, drink dog pee. And right. at what the same time now, we have a president who's you know avoiding his own bowels in front of the Pope, which even if that's not true, in terms of humor, it's irrelevant. Like these, the punchlines are writing themselves, you know, yeah. so on and so forth, but they won't touch it. And it's, it's very odd for me because there's some onion. I like my humor, uh, dark, dark. There's yeah, an onion. I've noticed. <laughs> yeah, no, no. But there's like an onion. They had like guest editorials. And yeah. the darkest one I've ever seen, and I'm just like, holy crap! They had an editorial by John Bonet Ramsey, the four or five year old beauty queen girl who was murdered, and the editorial goes, "Why are you guys so sad? I'm in heaven with the angels," and it's just written from her point of view about what a great time she's having in heaven. And you're reading this, and you're like, holy crap! This is awful, dark stuff. And now, it, 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 at a certain point, and maybe it's 2016 or the rise of Trump. Like it, it's much safer and the humor has to be, I, do you think that a lot of leftists were reacting to the idea that Trump weaponized humor and Twitter to become president? So they kind of are reacting against that. Like, how do you explain this? Like what, wh how did they lose their sting? <laughs> well, I think it's a number of things, but I think, I think one of the ways that they lost their sting was it, it was because they, purposefully adopted this hands-off posture where um, the politicians that they like, the people that are in power and the institutions um, that that control you know our public discourse, everything from you know, media and entertainment, education, um, the big corporations, all of this stuff is all dominated by people that they're an ideological lockstep with right and they don't they don't see these things as being funny. they see them as being good and true and and um, and and we need the, these things, and so I mean, just just for example, uh, the radical gender ideology stuff that so permeates our culture right now. Um, it's an absurd idea. This idea that a boy can be trapped in a girl's body, and that by dressing, um, you know, differently, or by having surgeries or whatever, you can resolve that problem and actually become the the person that you feel like in your mind, or you know, these are these are really radical and, and crazy ideas. And it used to just be mocked and laughed at kind of universally. Yeah. And now you do find very few instances of people on the left who are willing to make fun of it at all for a number of reasons. They, they want to promote it and they want to protect the narrative from criticism. And so you end up hearing from a lot of comedians who are basically like, you know, giving a sermon from the stage. They're like preaching to the audience and they're going for clapter as someone called it, where, you know, it's the, this applause of affirmation instead of, instead of laughter from the audience. And I always thought the first rule of comedy was to be funny. It's to be funny. It's to be subversive. It's to poke holes in the popular narrative, not try to prop up the popular narrative and promote it. And so that's, that's really where everything has kind of gone off the rails with comedy in my view, where I, I don't see comedy as being super funny anymore is because the things that are most deserving of mockery are the things that they are uh, least likely to touch. How is that the case in comedy? I mean, that is not how it should be. And so I think anybody who's willing to go there, who's willing to make these subversive jokes and say the things that you're not supposed to say is going to be successful for two reasons. They're going to make people laugh because those are things that are funny. Um, and at the same time, they're also going to attract more attention to themselves because there will be an effort to silence them or cancel them that will only actually amplify their voice. And you saw this, you've seen this happen with Rogan. You've seen it happen with Chappelle. Um, yeah. You know, but, but, but I see, I, I do see cases. Bill Maher made a joke in a monologue he was doing about the gender stuff recently. He, he was going on about how, you know, there's this trend and, and a, a greater and greater percentage of young people are, are identifying in the LGBTQ plus whatever camp. Um, to the point where it's going to be a hundred percent soon. It's like, it's crazy that the way that the trend is going and he's like, but when it comes to kids, you know, if we, if we just trusted what kids say, the world would be filled with cowboys and princesses. Like that's what they yes. identify as when they're little. And he's like, when I was a kid, I wanted to be a pirate, you know, thank God no one scheduled me for peg leg surgery and eye removal. And it's like, 
it got some laughter from his audience. And I, I, I remember thinking to myself when I heard that joke, when someone shared that clip with me, I was like, man, you know, like a lot of people might think that's just a normal, like a, 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 a silly joke to try to get some laughs. But I think it's actually very profound what he's doing there. He's, 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 um, he's taking, he's, he's mocking something that never should have been taken seriously in the first place. And he's doing yes. it at, at a time when you're not supposed to, when it's considered hate speech to even go there. And so I found that joke to be, was it like crazy hysterical? No, it was, it was mildly funny, but profoundly important. One of the things that I, uh, uh, appreciate about Christian Americans is that Christians, I think more than secular Americans have an understanding that evil is real and that evil isn't just, I, I made this point recently with a friend of mine. If the worst thing we can say about politicians is that like Hunter Biden gets hired and there's a kickback and you know, Joe has access, like we'd be in a utopia. Like if it's just some corruption, like people hiring their cousins, like who cares? Um, it's so much more like depraved in such ways that people who are even remotely decent would never enter their heads. And the, to your point about, you know, the, the peg leg stuff and the, the thing, the trans um, kids stuff, so-called, when you start chipping away at the idea of children and consent, and if they're consenting to like surgeries and they're in that position, like, where does this, where, do you, where are you going to start drawing this line? And I am, yeah, what else can they, if they can consent to ster being right. sterilized and mutilated, what else can they consent to? What yeah, that, that's where I'm going. Yeah, 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 yeah. That, that's exactly where I'm going. And and I think there is, um, you're a dad, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I, are you as, is this kind of a gimme question, but are you as concerned as I am by, there's this, it seems to be very obvious movement, including starting with John Bernay and that, that whole scene with sexualizing children, and at the same time, there is a profound mantra from the corporate press. You're crazy. This isn't happening. Uh, you're delusional. You're paranoid. And I, I specifically am thinking of there was that movie um, about saving child traffickers. I forgot what it's called. Um, uh, you know what I'm talking about. Sound of Freedom. Ago. Sound of Freedom. Yeah. And Bloomberg Opinion had a review of it, which was kind of calling it crazy QAnon, whatever. And mm -hmm. the reviewer was someone named Noah Berlatsky, who works for a pro-pedophile organization trying to normalize pedophilia. They could have chosen any reviewer. They chose him. <laughs> and I tweeted at every single member on their op-ed board. And I said, hey, were you involved in this decision? And is this concern you? None of them replied to me. I'm not surprised. But when you see things like this, you don't have to be you know, Alex Jones to be like, whoa, 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 whoa. If this is a mistake, why aren't these mistakes not getting corrected? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you would think they would be corrected if they were, in fact, mistakes. You would think that there would be people backtracking. Um, there's a lot of doubling down. And of course, yeah, a lot yes. of denial that it's even happening. I can't tell you how many times I've heard um, people say, no, we're not targeting kids. We're not targeting kids. But then the minute you like, but then the minute there's any attempt to prevent the targeting of kids, there's a freak out. Like, why are you stopping us from targeting kids? It's like, well, wait a minute. I thought you weren't targeting kids. You know, uh, why it, it, with the with the teachers like the the being unable to talk about uh, gender identity and sexual orientation with kindergartners and first graders? You know, it's they object to that so strenuously, which is weird if they don't care and they're not actually going after kids. Like if they if they're like, oh, well, we're not targeting kids. Well, then what's the objection to a law that would prevent you from targeting kids? <laughs> yeah, I, I'm thinking specifically of when Joe Camel was banned. And, you know, the argument was Joe Camel was the spokesman for Camel cigarettes and that, you know, this is targeting kids. And from a First Amendment perspective, I, I'm not particularly a fan of Joe Camel being banned. But there wasn't this freak out about like free speech, you're paranoid, blah, blah, blah. It was like, you know what? I like this is not the hill I'm going to die on. But in this case, this is the hill they're going to die on. And yeah. the, the I am gladdened and I'm, I'm curious to hear your thoughts that social media is in a position to, you don't have to say anything, you don't have to public posi have public position, you have a person saying one thing on one side of the screen, then you have the real facts on the other side of the screen, and right away you can see, okay, this speaker cannot be making this, these claims innocently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, what, what's the question there about social media? Like, is it well, in a I'm good just place curious there? Yeah, I'm just curious if you agree that social media is, in this case, doing so much work 
to kind of undermine this propaganda? In some cases it is. I think at least on a platform like X where you're allowed to talk about these things, this was part of the problem is you had a situation where not only was this was this ideolo- ideology being kind of pushed and integrated into the terms of service and whatever it was being, yeah, it's being, it's being basically enforced where you can't challenge it. Even with a joke, you can't challenge it. You know, like the joke that got us kicked off Twitter was a joke about how Rachel Levine, a transgender health admiral, was our pick for man of the year. You know, and that and that joke is what it got us locked out of Twitter. I mean, it was we weren't even allowed to try to poke a little tiny hole in that popular narrative, which was this idea that, yes, men can become women. In fact, they're the best of the women. Um, they get woman of the year awards. Um, that's a joke in and of itself. It feels like a South Park episode. Folks, I had stomach issues my entire life, and I've been talking about this for years it was by taking probiotics that I became a normal human being, something I thought, I, well, in this context at least, something I thought I could never be. So I am delighted to talk to you about Just Thrive, which is a product that not only I'm using, but is an issue that has affected me profoundly and has changed profoundly for the better. Life can be stressful, and it's not just your mind that suffers when you're tense and anxious because stress can make a mess of your digestion and immune system too. And you can handle it with the help of Just Thrive Probiotic and Just Calm. Say goodbye to frazzled nerves. Say hello to a steady, chill, more relaxed you. Yeah, this is the relaxed version of me. Seriously. So Just Calm's exclusive mood lifting blend is clinically proven to help you relax and breathe a little easier in as little as four weeks. And for the next level mood and immune support, use Just Thrive Probiotic, which is award-winning. It not only has 1,000 times better survivability than most probiotics, but this spore probiotic banishes bloat and constipation so your gut can produce more of serotonin, which is the happy hormone. And ask yourself if these probiotics that you see at the store have to be refrigerated, how can that probiotic survive your 98-degree body if it can't stand room temperature? Doesn't make sense. So with Just Calm and Just Thrive's probiotic, you'll have the ultimate stress-fighting duo to help you win the day every day. And with a money-back guarantee, what do you have to lose? And for a limited time, you can save 20% off site-wide at justthrivehealth.com with promo code WELCOME. And to learn more about Just Thrive Health and all their clinically-backed products, don't miss my special episode where I interviewed Tina Anderson, who is the CEO and co-founder. Take control today with Just Thrive. Let's get back to the show. Wait, do you know what's funny? Just something just clicked. Mm. You could make a joke that uh, Michelle Obama's a man on Twitter back then, and it's fine, but you can't make a joke that Rachel Levine right. is a man. Although <laughs> Rachel Levine is biologically male. So it clearly isn't about the joke, but about enforcing it. Can you walk people through that incident if they're not familiar with it? Because this was a pivotal moment in our culture. Because yeah. it led to Elon buying uh, a Twitter. It was nuts, man. It was, it, so this is back in, it's actually, we're about to hit the two year anniversary. So I think March 20th is going to be, um, I don't know when this is going to get, when this episode is going to be released, it may be released just before then or around then, but it will March be on the 20th. 20th. Okay. That'll be the, it's the two year anniversary of, um, uh, of when we got locked out of our Twitter account because we, what happened was, you know, USA today had named Rachel Levine their pick for woman of the year. And, uh, and it's, you know, it's, it's just like the headline itself, like when we, when we see a headline like that, it's like, man, this is like, this feels like a parody already. This feels like satire. It's not. And so now we've got to find a way to like exaggerate this. How are we going to exaggerate it? You know, like that's, it, it's, satire is often a, a I character. I'm sorry, I can't talk. She, she, Rachel Levine was named woman of the year. Yeah. Rachel woman Levine has year. no accomplishments. It, the, Rachel Levine's only accomplishment is getting that gig. And it's not like Rachel Levine became president. Senate majority leader, governor, you know, these are, these are accomplishments. What is it? Assistant secretary. Then with, I mean, this is not some kind of amazing, like, holy crap, the assistant secretary of the Navy's in the room. I better, you know, get my P's and Q's in order. It's insane. I, the accomplishment is the identity that is yeah, the accomplishment. Yeah. So, uh, which is just wild. And so, yeah, it's an insult to women everywhere. Like there are very accomplished women who deserve yes. that. Now, uh, Rachel was one of the picks for women of the year. So I guess they picked several, um, there were okay. like maybe four or five women that were selected for women of the year. Among them was a male person named Rachel Levine. So, you know, that, that seemed, that's like a, a joke itself. And, and so we, we had no idea how we could possibly exaggerate or caricature that. And so we're like, all right, well, Maybe we'll just make our pick for man of the year, Rachel Levine. And we kind of laughed internally about how this was going to get us booted from Twitter if we actually published this. But um, and that, and that, by the way, 
is one of the things that I think it's 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 how the censorship regime works and what it counts on is if they can make you fear that by saying something you might have a penalty you might get you might get yep. deplatformed then you will actually censor yourself and do that work for them because yep. you're constantly thinking what am I what's if I say this will it get me in trouble yeah it probably will so I'm not going to say it. That soft censorship is the vast majority of big tech censorship. Yep. I think yep. for every for every hundred instances of them actually engaging yep. in hard censorship and taking content down, there's a million more instances of people censoring themselves out of fear that they will experience hard censorship or be completely yep. deplatformed if they actually speak freely. And so that I think is a major problem. And and one of the things that you know we took very seriously when we were considering whether we would tell this joke is: do we want to be do we want to be humorists or satirists who censor ourselves to keep our platform? Right. And the answer to that question was an immediate no. Wait, wait, we don't hold want on. to be so those you, guys. You guys knew ahead of time this is rolling dice. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. High risk. High risk. I mean, okay. at the time, there was already a uh, hateful conduct policy in place that prohibited misgendering, you know, and I'll put that in scare quotes because. I consider misgendering when a, when a male refers to himself as a woman, but they consider misgendering when someone who identifies as a woman is referred to as a man. So um, we knew that misgendering was taken very seriously and could either result in just the, the tweet being taken down or our account being suspended altogether. And so, um, but we put it up anyway. We're like, let's see what happens. Let's, let's see if they take it down. We dare them to take it down, you know? Um, and what ended up happening, of course, was we published it and then the, you know, the trans activists got a hold of it and started like, getting it mass reported. And so we got an email from Twitter saying that our account was locked because we engaged in hateful conduct and we needed to delete this tweet in order to get access to our account again. And so we appealed it right away. And pretty shortly thereafter, the appeal was denied. And so we were just stuck in the situation of, you know, we've got to delete the joke to get our account back or refuse. And so I just, we talked about it internally. Everybody, we all agreed, like uh, yes. you know, there's several of us in, inside at the B that have ownership in it. And, and we had a little quick meeting on Slack and we we're like, we're not deleting this, right? Like this is the right thing to do is to not delete this joke. We can't admit that we engaged in hateful conduct because we didn't. For one thing, it's a joke. For another, it's true. A man is an adult male. This is an adult male. We made a true statement. We can't censor ourselves and delete it. That's okay. that's not even censorship. It's subjugation. If we're if we're and forced. Here's the other thing. It. It's not like this was some kind of high school kid who's getting bullied, where you could understand. Like, look, you guys are really punching down. You're causing some kid who maybe have mental right, issues. Right, right, right. This is a government official. Oh, who's yeah, lauded so everywhere. This is the this is the important yeah hugely important point okay this, the idea is that this hateful conduct this kind of joke that needs to be prohibited is punching down on someone who's yeah. marginalized we have power and privilege this person doesn't they have they lack power and privilege and so when we make a joke about them we're punching down on them and that's that's wrong it's like bullying it's mean and I'm sitting there thinking to myself you know this is a white male high ranking government official right. and. They're they're on the cover right now of USA Today receiving an award. I like if this person is marginalized, then the word marginalized has no meaning. <laughs> it, it, there's there's nothing about this situation that indicates being oppressed or marginalized. And but and also if you're that if if the biggest problem that you have in your life is that someone might joke about what gender you are, you're pretty pretty damn privileged. I mean, in the scheme of things around the world with what's going on in the world today, if that's your biggest concern is whether someone's making a joke at your expense or whether they're properly identifying your pronouns or whatever, I think that is profound privilege. And I beyond remember. that, if you, can, if you can have somebody censored for so much as joking yeah, about yeah, you, yeah. you're one of the most powerful people who's ever lived. Like that's Wait. the kind of – like kings have that power. Who else has that Wait. power? Censor on your behalf. I mean, right. there's not even information that Rachel Levine saw this or complained. It was like before the right. ink's dry, so to speak, people are running interference. Yeah, you have and a I team mean, running interference for you out there to make sure that your feelings are always protected. Like, I don't have that power and privilege. Do you have that power and privilege? Well, kind of. <laughs> I, I, I've, I've kind of radicalized my audience of, of autistic freaks, and they're really, really good at it. And they okay, have no so remorse get, or empathy. You'll so. get a Twitter mob going in, uh, in your defense. Yes. Um, By the way, I, I have a free headline for you on the second anniversary. Take it or use it as you will. It just came to my mind. Okay. U.S. Postal Service names Rachel Levine male person of the year. <laughs> 
M-A-I-L. Like M-A-I-L male person. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> let, let them have fun with that. <laughs> well, I mean, we're safe on Twitter now. We just republished our joke about Dylan Mulvaney being our new pick for man of the year. And, uh, Wait, but, and so, so, so you're locked. You say we're not we're not doing anything. Can you walk us yeah. through what happened after that? Yeah, we're not we're not deleting the tweet. I announced it publicly. We decided internally it was unanimous. We were like, no, we're not deleting yeah. this. It's 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 wrong. Like now is the time to take a stand. And if we don't, who will? It was it's that kind of thing, you know. It's like at some point somebody has to be willing to say, I'm not playing this game anymore. I'm not gonna censor myself for your for your, you know, to to guard your narrative. Um and so we didn't delete it. We announced that we wouldn't delete it, and that was it. It was like, okay, as far as we knew. We had just literally given up our Twitter account forever because there was no expectation on our, on our end that Twitter would change ownership or that Twitter would reverse its hateful conduct policy against misgendering. What, why would anybody have the expectation that that would ever happen? There was no reason to. Um, but you know, shortly after that happened, we did. Uh, Elon reached out to us because he had heard from somebody that we were suspended and that we uh, were locked out and. And he hadn't seen us tweet in a few days. And so he Wait, was actually he, messaging. He, you? he messaged the Babylon B Twitter account initially. Oh. And okay. we couldn't reply to him because we were locked out of the account. Yeah, yeah. And so we're like, we can see the message. We could actually log in and see that we had a DM from him, but we couldn't answer it. And so we're like, uh, Wait, you must have, it must have felt like being a ghost. Like, can you yeah. hear me? Hey, hey, Elon. Yeah, yeah. There was no way for us to respond. Yeah. So um, he ended up getting in touch with Kyle. He was able to reach Kyle, who's our, our editor in chief and say, you know, he was persistent. You know, we didn't respond to that message. And so he kept trying to get in touch with us. And he reached out to Kyle and was able to get in touch with Kyle. And, and they had, and had a conversation about, you know, what's going on with the censorship stuff, how ridiculous it is. Comedy should be legal. Why can't we make jokes? Um, and he mused at the end of that call that, you know, maybe it's just time for him to, to buy Twitter and, uh, wow. and make comedy legal again. And, you know, there was laughter on our end. It's like, haha, you know, okay. Um, we didn't expect that there would that he would actually make a move to do that. So it was several months later. It was about eight months later that he actually, of course, closed that deal and then took over Twitter, walked in with a sink in his hands and sent me a message that said, do you want me to restore the B account? There will be no censorship of humor. So yeah. um, that's kind of a brief uh, summary of it. What you know, people often ask me, uh, Mr. White Pill, why I'm so hopeful or, uh, about the future. And the, they're like, look how many people don't agree with you. And I, I always say, you don't need a majority. You just need an alternative. So mm -hmm. let's take the COVID narrative, for example. If there was just one big social media site, and in all fairness, I don't know what pressure they were under. So maybe this wouldn't have been legally a possibility. Maybe they'd be like locking up the CEO. Who knows? But if there was just one social media site that said, hey, these doctors and scientists who have pedigrees that you and I certainly don't have, Seth, who have made entire careers in medicine, they're asking very simple questions that like, where's the six feet distance coming from and how efficacious is this? Um, if there was just one site where their voices could be heard, the entire situation would have ended up very differently. So people who think, you know, you're not going to have the majority, it doesn't really matter as long as you have that one spot. Uh, it doesn't matter to some extent, but if you have that one spot, that one spot so much punches above its weight uh, in terms of impact. And we see it now because there have been waves of these, uh, for lack of a better term, shit libs. I know you can't curse, but I can. Uh, who are like, oh, That's a damn Elon. Liar. Okay. E Elon, uh, um, you know, is ruining Twitter. I'm out of here. I'm going to Mastodon or I'm going to this. And they're, Blue Sky, they're there. They flounce, but they stay. And they're not staying because they feel like this is their house anymore, but they're staying because this is where the action is. Uh, are you yeah. feeling this kind of narrative shift in the last couple of years since you took it over? Yeah, quite a bit. And uh, I, I to back to your point though about like there just being one place where 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 truth can be spoken or narratives can be challenged, and how how pro how profoundly important that is. You don't necessarily need a majority. I agree with that, and I, I, I make a point all the time about how uh, when it just comes to um, the truth itself and our willingness to speak it, to acknowledge it, and to speak it, there's this, um, um, there was this social conformity study that was done back in the 50s called the Ash Experiments. Are you familiar with yeah. that? Yes. And, and you know, the, basically what the Ash Experiments demonstrated was that most of the time, if you have everybody in a room uh, saying something false, um, 
the, the subject of the study who's being analyzed to see how to what extent they conform, most of the time they're going to conform. Like up to 75% of the time, they're going to go along with an obviously false statement because everybody else is saying it. And they may even question their own sanity because if everybody in the room is affirming you know, that two and two equal five, well, then maybe I need to say that too. Maybe it really does. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm crazy. Um, and what, but what they demonstrated in the ash experiments was they actually, they introduced a variable where they had, where they had somebody who was, who gave the correct answer to an obvious question and everybody else was still giving the incorrect answer. Um, and then when it got around to the subject of the study who had no idea that everyone was in on it and that, and that most people were giving the wrong answer on purpose to, to see how they would respond. Just the fact that one other person was giving the correct answer in the room, it, it's like it gave them permission to also say what was yes. true. And so, um, and I don't know why we're broken like that, like our minds work that way. Like we're social animals. We care very much about what other people think and whether wait, we're wait, fitting wait, in. We, you we don't, don't want to be an outlier. Why? Well, I know why. I'm just saying, I'm, I'm just saying it's like, it's, it's, it seems to be a flaw in human nature, obviously, that we are, that we try to conform and not appear to be an outlier. Um, and it, it matters to us so much. Um, and real quick, g give me your answer on, on why you would say that we care about that so much. Because, you know, especially like 400,000 years ago, when people had to live much more communally and primitively, like you have to go along with the pack. Cause if you're that outlier, you're probably going to cause trouble for everybody. Like you need to be working much more together. And, you know, Ayn Rand has said civilization is the act of freeing men, freeing man free from other men. I think it goes to that era where it's important to have this kind of group consensus behavior, especially in like tribal societies. Yeah. So an evolutionary answer. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, regardless of what the reason is, it's obviously the case that we care very yes. much what, what other people think and whether we're getting along and whether we're an outlier. And, um, and, and, and just if there is one other person at the table who's willing to say what's true, it does in fact embolden others and, and give them permission to say, you know, what they think is true, uh, and to, and to feel comfortable in their own sanity and to not feel like they're the lunatic. Um, can, can and I so, yes, I, I agree with you. Yeah. Because th there's this incident that happened to me in fifth grade. And every time I think about it, I get re-traumatized. And when I use the word trauma, I'm not using it loosely. And it speaks to exactly this. There's a riddle and people can find online where there's like a, a baseball bat and a ball or a violin and a bow for sale. And their combined price is like $1.25. And one is a dollar more than the other. Like what's the price of each? And the way it's worded, people always think it's one answer, but the real answer is the other. And I was in fifth grade and I was the one who got the answer correct. Everyone in the class and the teacher got the answer wrong. The teacher encouraged the class to yell at me, to tell me how I'm, it was like, just like Picard, that I'm wrong. At a, then I was wow. being difficult, even though this is math, this is an opinion. There are four it's lights, math. that thing. Yeah. Right. <laughs> then they, they she told my friend Michelle to sit me down and explain to me how I'm not understanding this very simple math problem. And I couldn't see their perspective because math is not ambiguous. It's either a yes or a no. It's just a logic thing. Mm -hmm. So it's not like the color of a dress, maybe different people. And later when there was parent teacher conference, Mrs. Ms. Gruen told my parents, you know, when I went home, I thought about it and he was right. And she never indicated that to me. And when I tell wow. you, I would have bludgeoned her with a shovel uh, myself <laughs> for doing this to like a 10 year old. I'm not joking at all. Um, so I've been there. And in that experiment, not intentionally. And when right. I tell you, it's um, one of the most disturbing experiences of my life. I'm not right. What did, you, did you question your own sanity? Did you question yes. like what was true? Like, no, I, yeah. I, I, yeah. I, I, I wasn't questioning my sanity. I, I wasn't understanding how everyone else, again, it's math. It's mm -hmm. not opinion. It's not a, you know, which president was better. It, I, th there's no other way to look at this answer. It's, there's only like three data points. Like where are you guys right. getting this? So, and the fact that no one else, even after explained it, were like hearing me, it was, I'm still getting triggered. Uh, uh, but yeah, yeah. It, it does speak to the, the, it's the, the pressure is crazy. Right. It's deeply frustrating. And of course it's way easier to just go along with what everyone else is yes. saying so that you're not, yes. so that you're not uh, ridiculed so that you're not challenged so that you're not criticized so that you're not silenced you know so um i don't know man, I, so been, back to that main point that, that, that doesn't you don't need right. a majority you need people who are willing to say what's true and if you have at least some people who are willing to say what's true any place to say it that's where the social media comes in 
you know, yeah. with the with Elon's acquisition of of Twitter was so critically important because it it, it gave us at least one place uh, where um, it, obviously there are other platforms out there and there's other you know less popular ones that popped up. Some of them they tried to suppress like Parler, but there's some others that exist that have never been widely adopted. And so they're not the town square in the same way that Twitter is. There's at least one real town square where both sides are represented pretty heavily. And, um, and, and you're allowed to actually say what's true there. Now that matters crucially because now there will be someone at the table who's pushing back. Now there will be a community note tacked onto that post that challenges the, the, the narrative. Um, yeah. and that will allow other people to say, so you can't, there's no way to overstate the importance and significance of that. You can't. Hey, folks, I want to talk to you about Bone Charge. They're a holistic wellness brand with a huge range of evidence-based products to optimize your life in every way. Founded in science, inspired by nature, all of Bone Charge's products adopt ancestral ways of living in our modern-day world. Their extensive range of premium wellness products help you sleep better, perform better, more energy, recover faster, balance hormones, reduce inflammation. The list is endless from blue light glasses to red light therapy, EMF management, and circadian friendly lighting. Bone charge products help you naturally address the issues of our modern day way of life effortlessly and with maximum impact. Let's suppose you want to burn more calories to help with your weight. You know who you are. Maybe you want to detoxify. You're eating badly. You had a few drinks. Maybe you want to ease stress and unwind. You may be very stressed right now. What you would want is their infrared sauna blanket. The sauna blanket works by raising your heart rate to that of physical exercise so it burns calories while you relax. You can burn up to 600 calories in just one session. That's like a treadmill. Sweating helps flush out heavy metals and other toxins and infrared heat and elevating your heart rate while relaxing it releases endorphins. We all love those. It's easy to set up. Heats up rapidly, and you can enjoy a session for 30, 40 minutes while relaxing, reading, watching TV, or this terrible podcast, which I don't understand why people enjoy so much. Here's the kicker. Bone Shard ships worldwide in rapid time. It's made from vegan leather, and there's free shipping in every sauna blanket with no hidden costs. Even better, easy returns and exchanges. You get a 30-day trial and a 12-month warranty. Go to bonecharge.com slash welcome. That's B-O-N-C-H-A-R-G-E dot com slash welcome. Use code welcome. You get 15% off. That's B O N C H A R G E dot com slash welcome and use code welcome to save 15% off. Hey, folks, Michael Malice here. You might know me as a Twitter troll, terrible author, insufferable podcaster, but I'm also an underwear model. And the underwear that I model and wear every day is Sheath Underwear. If you go to sheathunderwear.com, use promo code Malice, you get 20% off and you can be inside my pants. Why I love Sheath is. They have special dual pouch technology for both parts of your male anatomy. It sounds weird. The first time I tried them on, I'm like, what is this? And now I literally wear them every day. The great thing about Sheath, it was developed by an Iraq war veteran. And you know, overseas, it gets really, really hot. And Bobby decided, all right, what can I do to make sure I'm not suffering here in this heat? And thanks to his research, you can be comfortable in the comfort of your own home. It's great for cold weather. It's great for hot weather, keeps you secure and comfortable. And there's something really exciting about going on a job interview, going on a date, doing a podcast, knowing that your underwear has you in its grip, nice and secure and comfortable. Go to sheathunderwear.com, use promo code MALICE, you get 20% off, and you can get one step closer to looking as much like a hunk as myself. Let's get back to the show. I want to talk about something a little, a little personal, which is the... I guess the dark side of free speech. You're ethnically Jewish. You found Christ and now are, are uh, a Christian. Uh, I've seen people go after you, uh, Jew haters, with the claim that, well, since you're ethnically Jewish, you can't really be a Christian. And therefore, you and how the Babylon Bee is run is a scam uh, I, or, or whatever term that they would use. Um, you la I, I'm right. glad you're, I, I find it kind of disturbing because my understanding of Christianity, which is not particularly. Uh, um, uh, controversial is that it's open to everybody. God wants everyone to be saved. He died for all of our sins and he's just tripping over himself like that. Um, was it Michelangelo on the roof of the Sistine Chapel or whatever it is, stretching out his hand as much as he can. And humanity just can't even bother to lift their finger to kind of accept God's grace and, and be saved. So I'm, I'm just curious from your perspective, seeing that and how that affected you. Well, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, I, the, the, the Christian teaching and understanding is that God 
loved the world so much that he sent his son, Jesus, to die for the sins of the world so that everyone could be saved by believing in him, right? And placing their faith in him. And that's not, it doesn't exclude anybody. It's, it's the most inclusive thing imaginable. It's, it's available to everyone. Um, it's exclusive in that it has to be through Christ, but it's available to everyone. It's an invite that goes out to everyone. Um, and it's, and by the way, Jesus was Jewish. The apostle Paul is Jewish. You know, the, the Christian faith, it's not as if, it's not as if Christians and Jews have no relationship to each other right. at all. It's, you know, the, 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 the Hebrew Bible is, is our Bible. It's part of our Bible. Um, so, uh, you know, this, I, I don't know, I, I don't even really understand the criticism. The idea that I'm eth ethnically Jewish, therefore I can't be a Christian is just insane to me because Christ himself was a Jew. And in the early believers in Christ, the first believers in Christ, like the Apostle Paul, for example, was himself a Jew who believed that Jesus was the Messiah, our Savior. Um, so there's just, a, there's, there's, there's Christian Jews, there's Jews for Jesus, uh, and there's Jews who think that Jesus is not the Messiah, that maybe he was a prophet or whatever, but he's, but he's not. And there's, and there's debate and disagreement on that. Um, but it's certainly not impossible. And there's certainly, uh, many, many, many examples all the way back to the beginning of Jews who are believers in, in Jesus. So that, that whole thing doesn't really make much sense to me. Um, it's bothersome when I'm accused of pretending to be a Christian or something like yeah. that, because I'm, uh, you know, like I, like I'm like, it's not valid or, or genuine. Um, because I'm because I'm Jewish. I mean, that's that's kind of silly and crazy to me. But does it does it bother you, or is it an eye roll? Uh, I don't know. I mean, it doesn't really bother me. I don't lose sleep over it. Um, okay. I think it's what bothers me is is how widespread it is because there is actually a lot of that. It's not like it's just like one or two people who will say that. I mean, there's a there's a decent number of people who are. Uh, I, it, as it's become known that I'm ethnically Jewish, and, and when I say that, I mean I'm, I'm Ashkenazi through my mother's side, which, according, you know, Jews will tell you that that makes me Jewish, whether I, yeah. whether I, I, I am ascribe to Judaism and and attend synagogue or whatever, like doesn't matter. Um, I'm Jewish through my mom's bloodline, according to them, and so, um, you know, just the fact that that has become known and has uh, resulted in so many people. Uh, you know, either dismissing my opinion or hating me for it or questioning my motives for it. It just shows me how deep the anti-Semitism runs, how deep and wide that runs. It's shown me that in a way that's been very disturbing that I, I wasn't aware of. Uh, you know, you think that we're largely past this stuff and we're not. Um, can you talk about your testimony and how you found your faith? Because this is something that I think when Christians share is something that um, is very profound and, and personal and very moving. Yeah, uh, it's a great question. I appreciate you asking me that. Um, so I mentioned earlier when I was talking about you know my background that I I grew up in a in a as a pastor's kid. So I grew up in the church. My dad, uh, my mom actually converted to Christianity as a teenager, late you okay. know late teens, and uh, and eventually converted my dad too. And so my dad, you know, he was very skeptical and and, and oh didn't wow, have anything okay. to do with it. So my mom ended up leading my dad to faith, to the Christian faith. Um, and so it was actually the Jewish woman who converted the agnostic man who then became a Christian preacher and raised me in a Christian home. And so um, I was exposed to, you know, obviously um, Christian teaching from a very early age. So I grew up in, in the church and it was just kind of, you know, I, I went to vacation Bible school and Sunday school and... Um, youth group and everything growing up and sat in the pews and listened to my dad's sermons every Sunday. And so um, I got a lot of theology growing up, but I, 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 I generated an interest very early on in Christian apologetics. And whether it was uh, because I had doubts myself, and I did have doubts, you know, once you start to become an adult, when you're raised in something, you know, you just sure. by default believe that it's true. And then you get a little bit older, you go to college and you're, and you're getting exposed to other ideas and you're starting to... Um, starting to question, well, do I believe this just because I was raised in it, or do I really have reasons for believing in it? And I, it was never my understanding. I was never taught that the Christian faith was just something that is blind, that you just adopt without reason. I was always taught that there are good reasons to believe. And so I wanted to really understand at a deeper level, well, what are they? 
Um, so I started studying Christian apologetics in, in, in depth, and I, I read, you know, very widely in that, um, but both among philosophers, but also among, you know, Christian theologians and, and popular writers like C.S. Lewis and G.K. Chesterton and, and stuff like that. So, um, and Lewis was a favorite of mine. I, I fell in love with a lot of his arguments. So one of my favorite arguments for the existence of God is the argument from reason, um, which, which comes out in his, his book, Miracles, where he talks about whether miracles are, are possible and, and whether we should, you know, be able to believe that they could in fact happen. Um, so I wrestled with, I was, I was a Christian who kind of wrestled with, well, how do I know that Christianity is, is really true? Do I just believe this because, and, mm -hmm. uh, and I, it, it just reaffirmed my faith as I, as I started digging into these things, I, I realized that not only is, is theism in general, um, rational to affirm, but Christian theism in particular has a good reason behind it too. And so my faith became reaffirmed in that journey. And so, um, I've been, I, I've been a Christian for basically as long as I can remember. And I, I had, but I, I will admit that as a teenager, I went through many of those, you know, repeating the sinner's prayer over and over again, trying to make sure that I was saved. Um, I did that for a little while uh, before I started to actually rest in the promise of Christ without, without feeling my own inadequ inadequacy, uh, um, making it seem like it was invalid. Was there any particular moment in your life where you made this kind of recommitment to your faith um, and, and really kind of were born again? Yes. Um, yes. As a, as a, as a teenager, um, I, I would struggle to actually pinpoint the exact like day and time that this happened. I didn't like journal it and note it, but there was, there was a time in, in particular when I, when I was like, okay, I want, I want to make sure I'm, I'm really making a commitment on my own, that this is me making this commitment, that it's not just my parents raised me this way and I, and I should be this way because they want me to be this way. This is my faith. Um, I did have that moment as a teenager and then was baptized. And then, um, so, uh, and of course, you know, like I said, later on, you know, had my doubts and revisited that, but, um, there was, yes. One of the things that drives me crazy is, is this kind of contemporary fedora atheism, which makes the claim that, uh, faith has no utility and is just harmful to people, which is just demonstrably to me insane. I know personally know many people whose faith has been, made them better, better people, period, and also been of enormous utility to them in different parts of their lives, both good and bad. Uh, can you tell us a time when your faith has been most useful to you uh, in carrying you through? Yes. Um, I do like to avoid looking at faith, though, just as a utility. Like it's because sure. this is often a character. It's often a caricature of faith, too, is that it's that it's a it's a crutch. You know, that it's um, um, uh, people who are afraid of the dark, you know, are, 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 you know, grasping for something that can, that can give them hope or something, you know, um, they fear, they fear whatever they, 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 they need, they need something that to, to try to, to lean on, to try to get them through hard times. And religion can certainly serve that purpose, but, but the, but I don't view, you know, Christianity itself as something that is a that is a, a crutch that is to be leaned on and, and to be found useful. I think the really primary the primary question is not how useful is it, but whether it's true. Because um, if it's true, then it's important to believe in it, even if it isn't useful. In fact, it's important to believe it and affirm it and defend it, even if it means it's leading you down a path of suffering and pain and misery, um, which is certainly the case for many early Christians, especially the martyrs who gave up their lives, you know, defending the faith and affirming the faith. So. Um, you know, I, I, do, I do think that's an important distinction. But uh, for uh, instances where where it's it has been useful in my life, I mean, uh, man, I I don't even know where to list them. I think I, I think that everything that I value, a lot of the thing, many of the things that I value when it comes to just these first principles, these first things that you go back to about, you know, what is what are we as humans? Are we made in the image of God and not? Why do we have rights? Why, why are, why are we valuable? Uh, when does life begin? You know, some, a lot of the discussions that I'm involved with in, with, um, the, the pro-life movement and defending life, um, um, you know, against abortive choice, like all, everything comes back to, um, whether or not, uh, right and wrong are real, uh, whether or not, um, humans, have any real significance or inherent worth or dignity. 
Um, and so in every er I feel like in every area of life, in every area, all of these things that are meaningful to us that we debate every day on shows like this, they all tie back to whether or not there, anything is rooted in anything meaningful. Um, what is the point in any of this otherwise? Um, and does it all just go back to, you know, um, determinism and dancing to the tune of our DNA, as Richard Dawkins would put it? And if so, then, then really, what is the point? Why do we care? Why does he care so much and have so many moral objections to things? Right, it doesn't right. make any sense at all. And so, so it's not like, so like C.S. Lewis would say, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, you know, I believe in Christianity. Um, what was the, how is it exactly that he put it? Uh, something to do about, uh, it, oh, man, I don't want to mess Look it up. up. You're in front of a computer. It, Let's get the quote yeah. right. As the sun, it okay, yeah. Let me get the quote. Yeah, let me actually get the quote. We got time. Let's. He's such okay. a great wordsmith. Let's get the quote. Yeah, It'll, yeah. Let's not botch it. Yeah. I believe in Christianity, as I believe that the sun has risen. Not only because I see it, but because by it I see everything else. That's the quote. Yeah. But to your point, I wasn't thinking of it. I, I know your, your metaphor about being a crutch, but I think it's more like a Swiss army knife and also like a birthday cake because faith <laughs> is also the kind of thing where, but what I mean by birthday cake is I'm sure when wonderful things have happened to you, your faith also helped you appreciate them more and be thankful and being like, I'm got this gift on this earth. And, you know, having this relationship with God makes me appreciate it that much more and also makes me aware that other people don't and how blessed I am yeah. to have this. So I, I don't think it, I wasn't asking just in the sense of being a crutch. I think it's mm -hmm. maybe again, like it's like maybe eyeglasses where you do see negative things in a different context, but also positive ones. Um, and yeah. I do think that sense of um, humility and appreciation is one of the best aspects of at least American Christianity. I can't speak on other uh, countries how it's practiced there, but all the Christians I know are so grateful for the gift of life they've been given. And to me, this is something I talk about in interviews. This is what I was always taught about in yeshiva, that God has given you this just amazing gift and he wants you to thrive and to succeed and to make the most of it. And that's the best way to thank him is by living your life to the fullest. Um, and it, you know, that's kind of like a faith through work situation where it's just like, all right, like, thank you. And I'm going to do what I can with what I have. And I am grateful that you've given me this wonderful gift of life, although it's going to be hard sometimes, but it's not, what's the point of getting something if you don't have to work for it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and there's so many, so many layers to it too, because it's, you know, the, the Christian life from the Christian perspective, it's about conforming to the image of Christ and, and serving and loving others. And in many cases, you know, dying to self, right. That print, that idea that, um, you, you, you lose, you can gain the whole world, but what good is that if, if you lose right. your soul, right? There's, there's you, your perspective changes on what you're targeting and what you're going after. And you know, it's, um, uh, it, I think it's, it's profound the way that that changes the way that you perceive things and the way that you, you know, with the way that you go after your career and what you're trying to accomplish and what kind of impact you're trying to have on the world. Um, so it gives tremendous purpose too. It's not just, you're not just relying on it in hard times, which it certainly is, is, um, is useful for, but it also happens to be true. And it also gives you purpose in a way that I think that, um, other worldviews do not. Sometime in the early 80s, REO Speedwagon's airplane made an unannounced middle-of-the-night landing. This is my friend Kyle McLaughlin, the star of Twin Peaks. And he's telling me about how he discovered a real-life Twin Peaks in rural North Carolina, not far from where he filmed Blue Velvet. What was on the plane was copious amounts of drugs coming in from South America. Supposedly, Pablo Escobar went looking for other spots, quiet, out-of-the-way places to bring in his cocaine. My name is Joshua Davis, and I'm an investigative reporter. Kyle and I talk all the time about the strange things we come across, but nothing was quite as strange as what we found in Varnumtown, North Carolina. There's crooked cops, brother against brother. Everyone's got a story to tell, but does the truth even exist? Welcome to Varnumtown. Varnumtown is available wherever you listen to podcasts. 
let's get back to it. Um, one of the frustrating things to me, and I've spoken to, I forget who it was, it may have been Kyle. I don't want to out people and get them in trouble. But <laughs> sometimes if you have a headline that's like a headline making fun of itself, people don't get it and they take it at face value and they go crazy. Yes. Because some, I, I love something, that. <laughs> yeah, if something is the subject of a joke, it doesn't mean they're the target of a joke. I'm thinking yes. specifically because I got in trouble when Ron Paul was having a stroke online, uh, like on a camera. And I tweeted out that he's doing a great Joe Biden impression and people are flipping out like, oh my God. I'm like, I'm not making fun of Ron Paul. I'm making fun of Joe Biden. Joe Biden yep. is the target of that joke, not Ron Paul. Um, <laughs> so I remember specifically you guys. Don't you headline. hate explaining jokes too? Don't oh, you I don't hate explain it? Them. I mean, oh, no, 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 no. I've never yeah. explained it. No, 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 no. Um, so, but you guys had this headline about how AOC like killed herself by getting tied up in her shoelaces and people I thought you might reference that one through that, that whole incident very self-referential thing there um i mean yes. we've made we've made a lot of aoc jokes and we've all we, we often joke about how dumb she is and then we were getting a lot of criticism from people on the left like they didn't even make they're like that doesn't even make sense why are you calling her dumb she's so smart you know like they didn't they didn't get the joke from that angle and then we did a joke about our jokes about how dumb she is where you know, there were those layers to it where she's literally like she's got these long shoelaces that she's like choking herself and killing herself by getting wrapped up in them. She's so dumb. She's, you know, she strangled herself trying to get try, tie her loose, her, her shoelaces. And we even call her dumb in the headline because she's right. so dumb. And no, so I think it wasn't you said it twice. I think you said dumb. Yeah, we AOC may have said it twice. Kills herself yeah. in her shoelaces <laughs> because she's so dumb. Yeah, I'm trying to remember who wrote that one. It might have been Frank Fleming. Um, okay. that was great. was great. That was great. But we get, we get a lot of, uh, that one pops up every now and then where people, when they decide that they're mad at us for something, they'll be like, look how stupid these guys are. Look at this. They think that this is funny, you know? And they, and they post it like, as if we were, as if just that on its own with no context outside, it was supposed to be a funny joke. Uh, and I don't know, are they obtuse? Are they, are they just not getting it or, you know, are they being disingenuous? I don't know. I, I'm not really sure. There was Hold a on. funny one, though, recently, kind of like your Biden thing, where we did a joke about how uh, when Vivek dropped out and endorsed Trump, we did yes. a joke about how Trump had decided to appoint or offer Vivek a, a position as the manager at the 7-Eleven he was going to put in the White House. And that was roundly condemned by everybody as, as this racist joke at Vivek's expense or whatever. And we're like, wait a minute, this is a Trump joke. This was yeah. this was the joke was that Trump was uh, appointing Vivek as the manager of the 7-Eleven, right? Like really he was the target of the joke, not Vivek. But um but the great thing with that one was that Vivek like laughed it off and didn't treat it as being a big deal when everyone wanted him to be mad and everyone wanted us to apologize. It, but it, it's it's also there's such a difference between making fun of a population and making fun of someone specifically. And mm -hmm. I had him on my show. I asked him about this like in the last month and the point I made is before I, I, it bothered me because a lot of people were getting offended on his behalf. It's like, hey, this guy's a loudmouth. He's really articulate, well spoken. He punched his way up, you know, from nobody to be on that presidential debate stage. Maybe listen to what he has to say for himself and his opinion before you just shoving him out of the way and feeling comfortable getting uh, uh, angry on his behalf. This guy has on a platform and a voice. Yeah. So that really, yeah. really, uh, I found just, just so, so low. Um, are well, there... it was, it was a bunch of white people getting mad on his behalf, yeah, exactly. well, you know, like what is, what is up with white people thinking that they need to be offended on everyone else's behalf? It's just, it's the most silly and it's the most condescending thing. I think, you know, the, going back to that whole punching down conversation we were having earlier, I do think that if I was in one of these so-called marginalized groups and people were trying to protect me from jokes because they don't think that I could handle a joke, I would find that more offensive. That coddling would be more offensive to me than any joke a comedian could tell. But again, you weren't going after, you were after an individual. So this is really an extreme right. case where it's like, you're not even defending some group, which maybe not, doesn't have a public voice or platform. Like if you're going out, some makes fun of Vietnamese people. I don't think there's like a prominent Vietnamese personality who can say something to the contrary. I'm probably forgetting one, but this was an individual whose entire career was speaking his mind. So it right. just takes it a whole other level of, of absurdity. Are there yeah. topics that are kind of like landmines for you guys that you try to avoid, even if the joke's really funny? 
uh, uh, topics, yes, probably. Well, you know, sometimes it's like um, too soon jokes, like right after someone dies can be tricky. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, some kind of tragedy. We had, oh man, I mean, we've had jokes where we would public, we would, we would pre schedule headlines to go out over the weekend or something and they'll run on autopilot, you know, while no one is working. Sure. And it, you know, it'll be something like you know, SWAT team tackles AR 15 as shooter runs free or something like that. <laughs> and it's like, you know, a gun, a gun joke and it goes out an hour after a shooting happens or something like that. You know, like the proximity of, of a, of a gun joke to a shooting, um, can be very problematic. Um, Wait, we have on, to be, Seth, Seth, Seth. yeah. That is a better better argument for God's existence than anything C.S. Lewis ever wrote, <laughs> because he clearly has a sense of humor, <laughs> right? Um, man, uh, we we ve we are very careful now to make sure that we're not scheduling pre scheduling ahead. You know, um, gun jokes, gun control jokes, whatever. Uh, race jokes are always very touchy, and yeah. usually just because not because oh well we're racist and we want to conceal that, so we got to be careful about how we tell the joke. It's more like we want to make a point with this, but we don't want to be misunderstood and have everyone call us racist. And so, you know, when it, when it comes to a joke, it's about race. It's, it's you, we want to make sure that we're delivering it in a way. Well, first of all, it has to be a topic that enough people know about where they're going to get the joke. Uh, and also, you know, it needs to be really clear what point we're making so people understand the purpose of the joke. What are we actually taking a shot at? What are we jabbing at? Um, and what aren't we? Uh, so, that we have to be mindful on certain hot topics like that. And I think that, you know, the Vivek joke was a good example of that. It was everybody got so worked up about it. Um, and it wasn't always, it wasn't abundantly clear to everybody who even the target of the joke was. Uh, so, you know, those are ones that we have to be careful of, but it's not like there isn't like specific topics where we're like, no, no jokes on this topic. Um, we, we don't really operate that way. It's just, if we're going to make the joke, let's make it, it's got to be worth it. It's got to be worth the point that we're making. And if we expect a lot of backlash for like, we want to be able to defend this and say, this is, you know, this is, this was a joke worth making and you're all wrong. <laughs> so I had an idea and I, I'm just, I just thought of it because you talk about race and I would like your honest professional as a professional humorist opinion. Uh, I'm uh, going to be on, on Tim cast on April 1st, April fools. Mm -hmm. And I am very, very tempted to have a cardboard cutout of Justin Trudeau's face in blackface and wear it because I'm being dressed as Trudeau. I'm not wearing blackface. And one of my friends who I can't, the two, I'll tell you off air who the celebrities are. One said, that's hilarious to do it. The other says, you will be ruined. I would love to hear your opinion. Well, okay. My opinion is, you shouldn't be ruined for that. You know, this is okay, a new that's, thing where we, that's, you shouldn't be ruined for that. I think it's a new thing funny. where we've decided that that is completely out of bounds and off limits and it's no longer acceptable comedy. And and why we've decided to kind of like um, narrow the window or the box of what you're allowed to joke about. I don't think that that's necessarily a good thing for our culture. I don't think it's a good thing for race relations. I think that, I think that back when that, was wider and you were when you had more room to make jokes like that i think people got along better and i think that that humor was unifying and that it it it, it broke down some of those barriers whereas now we're just erecting more of them and we're and by am i making these things completely off limits um i don't think we're doing ourselves any favors treating humor as harmful especially on with 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 topics like that that's not the answer. Humor is the one thing that can heal. It's one of the things that can heal race relations when, when there is a lot of racial tension, you know, being willing to laugh at ourselves and each other and, and, and whatever. So, and, you know, caricatures and whatever, like all that stuff, appropriation, like all of these things are just, it's been so blown out of proportion how much people have decided to treat these things as just egregious crimes against humanity. Meanwhile, we have men dressed as women completely appropriating womanhood you know, making pop songs and being on the cover of magazines and on red carpets or whatever. Um, I don't see how it's, I don't see how it's any different from woman face, but you know, that's another conversation I guess we could get into, but, uh, what, so it shouldn't ruin you, but it might, <laughs> it might, that's a, are you willing to take that risk? Are you willing to do what we did with the Twitter joke and say goodbye to our Twitter profile and stand by I, it? I, I don't, first of all, I'd have to run by Tim. I'm not interested yeah. in having someone else have consequences for my behavior. I think that's immoral. <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm really on the fence because it, I might make the point by just holding it up the mask and being like, I was going to wear this. But then is that mm. cowardly? Um, mm. Also, he was dressed as Aladdin, so he wasn't even in blackface. He wasn't trying to be like a minstrel or anything like that. He was dressed like a, a, a cartoon character, and that cartoon character is of Middle Eastern descent. Um, so I don't know. Uh, and, and, and you've not given me any help. <laughs> with your was, okay, maybe you can help me with this. Who was it that decided blackface was wrong? Like when Tropic Thunder came out, it was okay. How long after Tropic Thunder did it become not okay? And, and who was it that so made that decision? We can go, okay, let's go down this rabbit hole because this is something I know a lot about. Um, and there, there's a lot of disingenuousness in recent times. And if you have any nuanced discussion of race, automatically, therefore, you're the clan. Because as we mm -hmm. know, the, clans, the clan is the purveyor of nuance in our society. Blackface <laughs> wasn't dressing like a literal black person. You look like a grotesque caricature. First of all, black people aren't that color. They were jet black. You know, mm -hmm. They would have these crazy mouths that black people do not have. And they spoke in this completely absurd uh, dialect. RuPaul has performed in blackface and people in the comments flip out. You can find the picture online. Spike Lee made that movie, Bamboozled, where a bunch of African-American performers performed in blackface because they still, even if you're black, you are not going to look like a minstrel character. That minstrel show stuff, just like a drag queen, most drag queens don't look like women. No woman, if, if you see a, a seven foot guy with like that, that, that those wigs and that makeup, you're not going to think, oh, that's a lady. It looks like a caricature. So... There's a difference between minstrel show blackface and Trudeau or Joy, Joy Behar when she got her skin darker. I think she was dressed for Halloween or something. That's not the same phenomenon. Darkening your skin in this grotesque caricature, a historic minstrel show like 100 years, 120 years ago, isn't the same as Tropic Thunder where you're mm -hmm. just putting darkness to your skin. But it's recently mm -hmm. become not only conflated, but as like the most unspeakable taboo imaginable and I find it, um, I, you can see why, because as soon as something can become stigmatized, that's a weapon to use against others. But it also, I, I, I don't know, uh, I, 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 is this the kind of thing where it's becoming more and more stigmatized? Because Megyn Kelly lost her show because all she did was she said, hey, when I was a kid, people dressed in blackface and it was okay, by which she meant not that it was okay, but it meant there were no consequences. Right. And people flipped out. I think they just want an excuse to fire her because her ratings were yeah. like absolutely yeah. nothing. It was clearly the case. But that really you know, screwed her up. Well, and isn't that an important point too, is that a lot of these, um, a lot of this narrowing of what you're allowed to make fun of or what you're allowed to do is designed to give lots of leeway to the people who want to silence and shut up and deplatform anyone um, who says things that either make them uncomfortable or who challenges their their narrative or their view of things? It's that's the whole reason to do that. There's no other reason to do it because you're not you're not you're not really protecting anyone from harm. What you're really protecting is the ideas that you don't want to be challenged or criticized right. through comedy or otherwise. No, that's what I, you're protecting. What's well, also the idea that evolutionarily, I'm in a status over you and I get to dominate you and put you down. So it's a great cudgel. Right. right. Yeah, it is. Exactly. But folks, head on over to malice.locals.com where Seth is going to take questions exclusively from supporters. Uh, Seth, we're running out of time. What has been your favorite part of this interview? Uh, the question, probably the question about my faith, my own spiritual formation. I mean, it's something I'm really asked about, even on, even on some like religious podcasts and stuff like Wait, that. Really? It's, a, it's a great question that gets really, yeah, yeah. It's a question that often gets overlooked and I think it gets really deep into the heart of who a person is and why of they course. do what they do. You know, people want to know what I think about the issues, but why do I think what I think about yeah. the issues? Um, I, I love those questions. So thank you for asking. You are welcome. This episode was brought to you by Just Thrive. Save 20% off a 90-day bottle of Just Thrive Probiotic and Just Calm when you go to justthrivehealth.com and use promo code WELCOME. Pluto TV is TV the way it should be, free. With over 300 channels, thousands of movies and TV shows costing zeros of dollars. So if you want to watch shows like Ghost, The Walking Dead, CSI, Star Trek, or The Price is Right, well, The Price is Right, it's free. 
Hit movies like Braveheart, Sonic the Hedgehog, Anchorman, The Legend of Ron Burgundy, or Mean Girls won't cost you a thing because everything is free. All you have to do is download the app, which, by the way, is also free. Pluto TV. Stream now. Pay never.